Hi, I'm Dr. Elizabeth Esty, your host today for our Colorado Bridge series, MAT in the ED. This is a series that takes emergency physicians, advanced service providers, and nurses through the nuts, bolts, and clinical nuggets of treating opioid use disorder in the ED. We are proudly sponsored by the Colorado Hospital Association and the Colorado Office of Behavioral Health. This is the first of a four-part series in which we will be discussing current thinking about addiction and addiction treatment. In this episode, we are discussing opioid addiction, one of the deadliest, most misunderstood, and most undertreated of chronic medical diseases. Anyone listening to this podcast knows that the United States is experiencing a devastating epidemic of opioid use disorders and overdose death. Our guest experts for this series are Dr. Steve Young and Dr. Donald Stater. Gentlemen, welcome to the program. Thank you for having us, Elizabeth. Thank you, Elizabeth. Steve, can you tell us a little about yourself and what you do? How did you become interested in this topic? Yes. Okay, I've been an ER doc for many years, and I basically stumbled into addiction medicine. Um, A good friend of mine in New Mexico, Eric Ketchum, was a medical director of the emergency department in a rural area, Farmington, New Mexico. And the methadone clinic in that community uh, was about ready to close down because they couldn't find a doctor to staff it. So he reluctantly accepted the position, mostly as a form of community service, and ended up experiencing it as being very rewarding. He told me about his experience, and then about roughly the same time, the same company that was running that clinic was opening clinics in Greeley and Pueblo, Colorado. They could not find a doc to staff those clinics, so... I took the position and really haven't looked back since. Uh, Now I work for the university uh, for uh, addiction research and treatment services, which is the division of the Department of Psychiatry, Um, doing addiction pretty much full-time. I still do uh, some part-time emergency medicine. When you started treating this patient population, what did you see that confirmed your desire to go into this field? When you're treating patients with addictions in the emergency department, there's a sense of futility and a lot of frustration um, that these patients, there's really nothing you can really offer them. In the addiction clinic, I found that to be just absolutely uh, uh, to be not true. (laughs) Um, I found the opposite to be true. These patients come into the clinic, uh, they're really at one of their lowest points of their life. Uh, frequently, they haven't bathed in a, in a week or weeks. Um, they don't have a job. They, may, they probably don't have a car. They've burned every relationship they've ever had in their life. Uh, so they're pretty much at the end of their rope when they come in. And literally within a matter of days, their lives can be completely turned around. And it's, it's miraculous. Um, and it's just immensely rewarding. And not at all what I thought it would be. Don, how about you? What sparked your interest in opioid use disorders? Well, I can link my interest in this topic back to a single patient. And I was working at one of our freestanding and emergency departments. And uh, we had a person drive up and drop off this lady. I was watching this all on the, the security camera outside, put her in a wheelchair, and she came back, and she was absolutely limp as a noodle. The security guard started yelling, and as the doors opened, I saw this blue Smurf-like creature, young female, emerge, who was apneic, obviously. We were all ER docs, and I was thinking, okay, 20-something-year-old blue girl, not breathing. She's an overdose. Threw her on the bed, pinpoint pupils, yelled for the nurse to get naloxone, started breathing for her with a bag valve mask, gave her a dose of naloxone, and she popped, popped right back up, and immediately did what most of our patients who have a severe opioid use disorder did, start going into withdrawal and start demanding that she leave immediately. Luckily for me, the, the homie drop-off person that she'd come with had uh, chivalrously left the scene and she had no way to get home. So she was with me for the course of the next uh, four hours, during which I had to push naloxone on her again two more times. She had gotten into something really nasty. She was my only patient for around two of those four hours. So I went in and actually started talking with her, giving my typical talk about you're throwing your life away, you should quit, what are you doing? And I asked her a question that changed the course of my medical career. I said, how did you get addicted to opioids? And she said it was actually through an ER doctor like you who had prescribed Percocet for an ankle sprain when she was in college. 
And the reason why that resonated so deeply with me is because earlier that day, I had prescribed Percocet for an ankle sprain. And I thought that I was practicing really kick-ass medicine. I had not realized how dangerous my practices were and in a lot of ways how wrong my practices were. So when I went to discharge her, I actually started typing in heroin overdose. And guess what? No heroin overdose in our EMR. No opioid overdose in our EMR. No place to refer the patient. And suddenly, all these things that have been present for years started bothering me. Because I had seen countless opioid overdoses, and I'd been discharging them with paperwork that doesn't friggin' make sense. Never bothered me until that patient. And what that did was light this kind of inquisitive fire in me of, what are we doing? What have I been doing my entire career? What is wrong about that? And it led me to start a task force with Colorado ASAP to write guidelines for Colorado ASAP, um, the 2017 Opioid Prescribement and Treatment Guidelines. That led me to a secondary career now with the Colorado Hospital Association as their senior pain management and opioid policy physician advisor. And uh, now spend probably around half my time doing opioid work, both policy work, and trying to change the way we treat opioid use disorders and also how we treat pain in Colorado and across the country. So clearly, there have been a lot of changes in Colorado, some of them thanks to you and thanks to the Colorado Hospital Association. What do you think the average ED provider out there is doing now? Are they still stuck in that ineffective cycle that you experienced? Or has there been a lot of change in ED practice around addiction? So I'd say that really the tide, in my sense, is starting to change. And the tide has started to change primarily around opioid use. Everyone knows we've been overusing these drugs for too many years. We've really done a good job in trying to limit that use. And then the cool thing is we've been taking up altos or alternatives to opioids. And I'd say there's no state in the nation that uses more altos than Colorado. We've trained now 90 out of our 100-some hospitals. Um, Colorado docs are really taking this opportunity to revolutionize their practice to heart. So I think that there we're, we're leading the country. Where I think we're lagging behind a lot of people is in the treatment of addiction. What not prescribing opioids and giving altos does is it exposes people to less risk. We create less patients who are addicted. But in this country, we have 2 million people who are right now addicted to opioids. We have to help them. If we really want to curb our overdose numbers or death numbers, we have to help those patients and we have to treat addiction like a medical disease. So I'm so happy that we're doing this podcast on those topics. That brings something to mind that I see every day in clinic is the scenario, the patient comes in and they've been treated for you know, years, sometimes decades with opioids, uh, you know, for chronic pain conditions. And those, either the pain specialist or the primary cares, have suddenly cut them off. Um, sometimes, it, hopefully, it's not too suddenly, but sometimes it's very abruptly. And then they they become desperate uh, frequently. I mean, I've seen women in their 70s out on the streets buying heroin, you know, after having spent decades being treated with opioids. And... Uh, and then they're in the city park buying heroin. Um, they find their way to our clinic, and it's it's really tragic. And so that's unfortunately a consequence of the best intentions of things like uh, Alto and decreased prescribing and PDMPs. Yeah. So I, I will say I've seen the same thing, um, opioid refugees. And I think that that's very different than Alto. Um, because what I think ALTO is in limiting opioids is really for acute pain patients. I agree that we have in this country an epidemic of patients who have chronic pain, who have been put on pain medications, opioids, and who are stable on those, who all of a sudden their doctors have just labeled them an addict without knowing what addiction is and decided that they either need to be rapidly tapered or cut off and then fired from their practices. And to me, those are true casualties of this opioid epidemic as well. Okay, gentlemen, now that our audience knows a little bit about you both, let's get right into it. Why is addiction so misunderstood? So I think that there's really two reasons. The first of which is that you're just never taught this in medical school. Around one year ago, the New York Times had a great article which showed that out of the 180 American medical schools, only 10 of them had an addiction curriculum. We're talking about the number one killer of Americans under 50, 
yet only 10 medical schools think it's important enough to teach. Instead, you're learning about, you know, the cells that live in the gut, and you're learning about basic pathophysiology, which has nothing to do with patients, but we don't teach the basic pathophysiology that actually matters in, in America in 2019, which is the pathophysiology of addiction. The other thing I think that's really important is the fact that most of us come to the table, come to medical school or college or even a high school, thinking you know what addiction is and what an addict looks like because you're taught this in your family. I've had family members who struggle with addiction, from alcohol to pills to methamphetamine, IV drug use. And I knew from a very early age what type of people they were. They were bad people. They had thrown their life away. They were the black sheep of our family. So I came to medical school, and I even came to the first five years of my practice thinking that I knew what an addict was, and an addict wasn't a good person. And I think we have to overcome so much of that bias that we've been given by our parents, by our society, by our culture, when it comes to being an actual friggin' physician and looking at this through a scientific lens and treating this like a medical disease. Absolutely, Donna. And to piggyback on that, I think it's good to kind of frame uh, frame the opioid use disorder epidemic uh, in terms of some national statistics. Um, overdose is the number one cause of death in patients under the age of 50. When you look at tobacco, alcohol, and drugs, it contributes to over 632,000 deaths in the U.S. Opioids contributing around 72,000 of those. We need to change our culture. Yeah. The number that's resonated most deeply with me is America is a warrior country, right? We, we fight wars and we, we in the past have, have done a great job winning them. And when you look at all American wars in the last 100 years, we're talking about World War I, World War II, Korean War, Vietnam War, all our wars in the Middle East. We lost a little over 600,000 Americans. In the last 18 years of the opioid epidemic, we've lost around 700,000 Americans. And really what this is that people don't realize is that these are wartime casualties in a domestic area. And I think the magnitude of death that this epidemic has brought and the magnitude of heartache can't be overstated because when you compare it back to the worst thing we can think of, which is war, right? War, where we're actively killing one another. This opioid epidemic trumps that. Don, to circle back to this question of what addiction is, I've heard you ask audiences the question, can a baby be born addicted to opioids? And I think your answer to that is instructive. Yeah, so, uh, so this is one of my favorite things to do when I give talks, is to get in front of learned medical professionals, mostly my colleagues, and ask them if they've ever heard of a baby being born addicted. And everyone will nod their head and shoot their hand up and say, yes, I have heard of these babies, these addicted babies. And... It's very rare that a person actually challenges that. And I think, one, the first thing all you listeners should know is there is no way in Hades that a baby can be born addicted to opioids. And the fact that so many of us as medical providers believe this just shows how deep our ignorance about this topic is. So I think, one, now that most of you are probably awake or either grabbing your second cup of coffee while listening to this, let's talk about what addiction actually is and why babies can't be born addicted. I think so often we mistake addiction for dependencies. And dependency, sure as heck, a baby can be born dependent on opioids. So when they come out, they're withdrawing, right? And they're shaking and they're having, you know, neonatal abstinence syndrome. But that's only one component of addiction. So in the simplest form, let me tell you what addiction is. An addiction is dependency plus aberrant behavior. And it's actually the behavior that we really give a crap about. The fact that they're dependent, that's easy to treat. Just give them an opioid agonist. The fact that they're having all these other activities is what's really bad about addictions. So let me then introduce this other easy way to kind of grade addiction. is It's the four C's, right? The four C's consist of loss of control. Right? That opioids, you can't control how much opioids you're using. You're kind of using opioids in excess to what you mean to. You're taking excess doses, right? So that control thing is lost with the bad addiction. 
The second thing is that you're using despite negative consequences. And that's really huge. You know that you might die if you shoot up that new batch of fentanyl that you got or batch of heroin that you got, but you shoot up anyways. You know that if you use again, you're going to get kicked out of your house. You're going to be estranged from your family, but you use anyways. So there's the opioids really do take over your ability to reason through consequences. You have compulsive use. So despite, and that's the third C, compulsive use, despite your best intentions to not use, you use again. And it's almost like someone has hijacked your brain and made you use again. And then the fourth C is cravings. And that kind of goes back to the physiologic dependence of it. Now, if you wanted to get even more granular, anyone on this podcast can look up the DSM-5 Diagnostic Criteria for Opioid Use Disorder. There are 11 of them. And basically, mild opioid use disorder is you have three or less Moderate opioid use disorder is four or five, and if you have a severe opioid use disorder, you have six or more of those criteria. But to me, as an ER doc, I'm a simple-minded creature, right? If you want to do the two criteria, it's your dependent, plus you have aberrant use. If you want to remember the four Cs, those are easy. Loss of control, use despite negative consequences, compulsive use, and cravings. So babies are dependent, right? But no baby is out there trying to trade you diapers or milk for heroin, right? No baby is out there saying, you know what, mom, screw that. I'm just going to go use some heroin in the corner, right? Babies aren't advanced enough to actually have aberrant behavior. Their behavior consists of eating, of pooping, of crying, right? And doing other baby stuff. They're not addicted, Guys, I remember uh, just the other day hearing that the United States uh, were 5% of the planet's population, but we account for 70% or so of opioid use. So a lot of Americans are using opioids, prescriptions for the ankle sprain. Most of them don't get addicted to opioids. Steve, maybe you could speak to why some people get addicted. What predisposes an individual to an addiction? Well, we know that at least fifty uh, percent of uh, that that fifty uh, percent of uh, a person's potential for a developing an opioid use disorder is genetic and epigenetic, and that has a lot to do with uh, different polymorphisms of, of receptor types. Um, it's it can be pretty complicated, and obviously, this is an evolving field. There's a lot left to to learn, and I think the more we learn that the, the higher the percentage uh, will increase. The percentage that's genetically Correct. predisposed. So but see, beyond genetics too, there's a lot that has to do with psychologic factors. People who struggle with a psychologic disease, be it depression, be it anxiety, be it PTSD, are a lot more predisposed to developing opioid use disorders. So a lot of it has to do with your comorbidities as well. And there are also um, some negative environmental factors, such as abuse, trauma, uh, that people can experience. We see this in our clinics every day. And uh, actually, trauma-informed uh, care is a huge part of what our counselors do in treatment. Yes, and, and then to kind of piggyback on that, you'll see so many of our patients who struggle with addiction often have a background of childhood trauma, be it sexual abuse, physical abuse really difficult social situations, you know. There's a thing called the ACEs score, uh, Adverse Childhood Events Score, and that correlates very well in some cases with patients who become more at risk for developing an addiction. Um, you know, and the last thing I'd say is your fishbowl, right? If you're in an environment where a lot of people have been using drugs from a young age, be it opioids, be it marijuana, be it heavy alcoholism, you know, you learn those behaviors, you normalize those behaviors, and you're so often exposed to drugs at a young age. And maybe, Steve, as an addiction guru, you can kind of talk a little bit about kind of the effects of drugs on a developing brain, but they are profound. They are profound. And we know that there's a, a direct correlation to age of onset and the potential for developing an opioid use disorder or any kind of substance use disorder. Um, I think roughly 90% of all patients with a substance use disorder um, started using when they were a teenager. And just to tie this back to opioids, that's why there's a huge move, by the way, to take opioids out of use for wisdom teeth extraction because it's just exposure at way too young an age. And it's a normal exposure. 
So when you look at most 18-year-olds or 19-year-olds who have these developing brains, developing forebrains especially, they're exposed to opioids when they don't need to be. Steve, I wonder if you could speak to the epigenetics. You mentioned that a moment ago. What's the relationship between being in that fishbowl and what the intrauterine environment does to people? Right. I'm not a geneticist, but uh, I know that the area of epigenetics is huge right now. And obviously, we're not talking about DNA, but we're talking about peripheral effects that can be transmitted down generations. They now believe that some epigenetic changes uh, can be passed down from seven generations. So there are certain forms of trauma, um, you know, emotional, physical, that will actually affect kind of the epigenetic material that's passed down. And that can, that can be passed down for seven generations. Wow. So we're up against a a real challenge there. And it sounds like for every other disease, we've got a mixture of biology, environment, and psychology at play here. Um, Steve, would you be able to expand more on uh, current understanding of addiction? Addiction is such a complex process that's difficult to easily define. We now know that addiction is a chronic, relapsing brain disease. It's the transition from control to impulsive and compulsive drug intake. It's often described as a reward deficit disorder, which can be understood from a physiologic as well as a psychological perspective. And I think one of the most important things about that definition is chronic. Yeah. Once people develop an addiction, it's not like they go to a seven-day program and are cured. People who struggle with addictions oftentimes have to really work to maintain their sobriety because they have a chronic disease. It's like having an MI when you're 20, right? You have that diagnosis of coronary artery disease throughout the rest of your life. And really with addiction, it's the same thing. Even though you might be in a long-term recovery, it's a chronic disease. It's not this, you know, send them to rehab for a month and hallelujah, they're cured. That's the wrong way to think about it. Steve, could you tell us more about what exactly is going on in the brain of a person who is addicted? So I borrow most of my understanding of addiction from George Koob, and he's a giant uh, in the field of addiction medicine. He's a neurobiologist with the NIH, and he, among others, described the three, the three stages of the cycle of addiction. Um, those would be binge intoxication, withdrawal, negative affect, and preoccupation anticipation. The three regions of the brain that correlate best with these three stages would be the basal ganglia, the extended amygdala, and the prefrontal cortex. The three stages interact with each other, become more intense, and ultimately lead to the pathological state of addiction. Yeah. And, you know, in addition to those three brain areas, you talk about the neurotransmitter that helps them communicate all with one another. And for addictions, that neurotransmitter, the king of addiction neurotransmission is dopamine. Yeah. And beyond pleasure and reward, Steve, you know, dopamine, my friend Corey Waller often talks about dopamine as the motivation neurotransmitter, right? It's the reason that we do things. So we all want to basically pursue pleasure, and avoid things that make you feel bad, okay? So in terms of dopamine, when you get up, you have a basal dopamine level, right? That spikes in the morning, that gets you up. You go, you grab your cup of coffee, that makes you feel a little better, it gets you ready for your day. And then we all do things during the day that hopefully will give us pleasure, right? So we go out and you go to a really good meal, that gives you around 150% of your basal dopamine level, right? So it's a pleasurable experience, especially when we're younger and you're a teenager. You're, you're chasing after the cute guy or the cute gal. You're hoping to copulate, right? And if you copulate, then you get a 200% dopamine release. And yes, I did just use the word copulate. Hopefully it's better than sex. And then finally, when you actually start abusing drugs, be them nicotine or alcohol or morphine, that gives you a release of dopamine that's better than good sex, right? That's why people get addicted to these drugs and start pursuing them. Now, the, the one that's king in terms of, of drugs, in terms of basal dopamine release, is methamphetamine. And methamphetamine gives you greater than 1,000% dopamine release. So it's really a really damaging drugs and how much it creates of that dopamine. But like anything, if all there was was pleasure... If all it was was, hey, use drugs and you're going to feel nothing but awesome, 
then I don't think any of us would have a problem with drug use. The problem is that there's a tremendous, a tremendous dark side to these drugs. And the fact that your body wants to maintain homeostasis and then stops making dopamine. It destroys your dopaminergic system. So Steve, as we disrupt this dopaminergic pathway, what happens in the brain? Well, these super physiologic concentrations of dopamine will eventually lead to decreased concentrations of dopamine, decreased number of dopamine receptors, and in severe cases, neurons will actually die. What we see clinically is that patients first use to get high, then use to feel normal, then use simply not to get sick. And if I can chime in with just a sentiment is, you know, we talk a lot about pleasure and a lot of reward and a lot about high, right? Um, But I think that sometimes that's oversimplification, that our patients who struggle with opioid use disorders aren't just hedonists who are seeking pleasure. When you talk with with this patient population specifically, you'll find that it's not to get high, but so often it's to find relief that these patients so often struggle with depression and they struggle with anxiety and they struggle with thinking that the world is an okay, good place, right? Because they've had childhood trauma, because they've had all these bad things happen to them, because they've struggled with addiction. And when they get their first dose of opioids, so often you hear them describe that is the first time that they felt not worried or not anxious or not depressed. The first time that they thought, you know what, the world is okay, the world is a great place. So, you know, I just want to add that nuance that is not all about pleasure and about hedonism. So often, patients who fall into an opioid use disorder are just looking for relief. Steve, I wanted to pick up on something you said earlier. You mentioned that later on, the prefrontal cortex is affected by opioid use disorder. Uh, How does that impact people? Well, the prefrontal cortex is primarily responsible for executive function. It's it's what makes humans human. Uh, and there are specific regions within the prefrontal cortex that are most affected, uh, most notably the anterior cingulate gyrus and the uh, uh, orbital frontal cortex. The, the anterior cingulate gyrus is responsible for inhibitory control. Uh, disruption in its normal function leads to compulsivity and impulsivity. Uh, impulsivity dominates in the early stages of addiction, then compulsivity takes over. Uh, this represents a shift from positive reinforcement to negative reinforcement, from using to get high to using not to feel uh, withdrawal. So the other area, the orbital frontal cortex, is responsible for salience attribution or determining what's important to us. Disruption in its normal function leads to the altered perception of a substance's value. Opioids become the most important thing in someone's life. Other priorities like food, relationships with loved ones, employment, obeying laws, maintaining health are subverted. So opioids are the most important thing to a patient with an opioid use disorder. Absolutely. Another uh, another region of the brain that's important is the habanula. It's the center of the anti-reward system. And in withdrawal, it's activated. It inhibits uh, dopaminergic cell firing. This in part leads to the negative mood associated with withdrawal. A quick digression uh, for emergency docs. The habanula has a significant role in depression. There are lots of NMDA receptors there. Uh, Ketamine, one of our perennial favorite drugs, is an NMDA antagonist. And this is how ketamine treats intractable depression and acute suicidality. This, by the way, Steve, is how we know you're an addiction specialist and way smarter than me. You know all these different brain areas that I tried to forget when I was in medical school. Um, To take it to a global perspective, when you look at patients who struggle with opioid use disorders and you look at their brain volume over time, because of that program cell death, their brain volume actually decreases, especially in that prefrontal cortex that makes you, as as Steve said, that makes you human, that makes you make good decisions. You know, that area is so adversely affected by opioid addiction. Steve, you've described how people first use opioids to get high, and then they use opioids to stave off withdrawal, and then they use opioids simply to not feel miserable. What's happening in the brain that correlates with that changing experience? 
Well, that process is commonly referred to as allostasis, and it's the process where the equilibrium or set point of a system is changed. Uh, this is opposed to the process of homeostasis, where the system always returns to its original set point. A person's uh, hedonic affective state, or simply how they feel, changes over time with drug use. In the beginning, the hedonic regulatory system is dominated by the upregulation of dopamine. But as the time goes on and multiple cycles of intoxication and withdrawal occur, dopamine is downregulated, and the stress neurotransmitter, corticotropin releasing factor, and the dysphoric neurotransmitter, dynorphin, are both upregulated. Steve, that was that was great for maybe your senior year assembly. Don, could you dumb it down for us and give us the eighth grade version? Yeah, sure. I'm good at being a simple-minded ER doc. So, so you know, one, this all, the concept of allostasis really is the unifying concept behind what happens with addictions, right? So you have too much dopamine. Your body says, yo, we've got too much dopamine. Let's start destroying the cells that make dopamine. Let's hide all the receptors that say dopamine is there. And as your body does that, you're resetting your set point. And again, to kind of go back to that example of people use to get high, right? So first it's about hedonism. And then people use to feel normal. Then people use to feel to, to not feel sick. So their new baseline, if I may say this, is your highs are not as high. Your new baseline is misery. And your withdrawal is hell. And that's what people get into when they have a profound addiction, you know, and that's why they look so miserable. That's why, as Steve mentioned, they haven't showered. That's why they're living out of the car. That's why they have no relationships, because they're living in a new allostasis type hell. And we in the ED have all seen this with our patients who struggle with alcoholism. Our chronic alcoholics who come in several times a week and are aren't there because they're intoxicated and feeling great. They drink to the point of stupor because they can't control it. And when their alcohol levels drop, they go into florid withdrawal. It's no longer about pursuing pleasure. And you and the ED treat that alcohol withdrawal very seriously as a medical emergency. The same is not the case in my understanding of opioid withdrawal in the ED. That's absolutely correct. I mean, all of us, when a patient comes in and they have alcohol withdrawal, we jump all over it, right? We give them tons of benzos. We give them phenobarb. We fear bad alcohol withdrawal or delirium tremens. We know that's a medical emergency. What really went wrong is saying that opioid withdrawal is not a medical emergency. They're not going to die, so it doesn't matter. Just let them withdraw, give them some clonidine, give them some fluids, and then street them. And that's been our old way of treating opioid withdrawal, which is tremendously flawed. Don, I've heard a lot of new terminology associated with addiction medicine, including the fact that the term addiction itself is coming into question. Why is that? So, you know, I think that I do not like the term addiction. And I know that a lot of my colleagues feel the same way. Because addiction is a term that's been so stigmatized recently um, that, you know, that we really need to rebrand this. Also, I think that the term addiction doesn't really reflect what's happening at the neurobiology level, which Steve so eloquently alludes to. So let me, let me give this to you. If you're an ER doc, this is where it resonate with you. One, if you have a patient who comes in and they have three-word dyspnea, They've got big time JVD. Their legs are tree trunks. You know, what does that patient have, Steve? What, what does that patient have? Congestive heart failure. Congestive heart failure, right? You need to give that person some Lasix and make them pee. Now, you take that same person, and let's say they haven't peed for a week. They have tree trunk legs. They're short of breath, right? And their blood pressure is 260 over 140. Steve, what does that patient have? Renal failure. Renal failure. Acute renal failure, right? So these are not mysteries to us. And then we have this disease process, which absolutely destroys the dopaminergic system, that destroys how the prefrontal cortex, that which makes you human, works and shrinks it, right? And you see all these manifestations that are behavioral, that are regulated by the brain, where people make bad decisions, where people make decisions that might put their life at danger, where people act only in the pursuit of a drug or an opioid. And the right word for that isn't addiction. The right word for that is brain failure. These patients have opioid-induced telencephalonic brain failure. 
right? And we didn't talk about the telencephalon. So, so Steve, I'm going to steal your nerd, your nerd, your nerd uh, ages for a little bit. But the telencephalon is the biggest part of your brain. It kind of constitutes that kind of prefrontal cortex. It constitutes those these limbic systems that we're talking about. It is damn important, and it is destroyed by opioids. So, I and many others are starting to talk about this in an organ failure type of modality. And when you look at it and when you compare the cost to renal failure and you compare the cost to heart failure and you compare that this is a chronic relapsing disease like your CHF patients, it fits. It fits perfectly. And that is how I think and many others think we should be approaching addictions. It's brain failure. Brain failure sounds pretty grim. So, Steve, are the neurological changes we see in addiction permanent? Yes, the short answer is yes. Cortical neurons are destroyed through addiction and don't grow back. However, there are other neural pathways that can be developed. There's a commonly used analogy with interstates. You want to take an interstate through town. It's the fastest and most direct way. It's closed. You can, however, take back roads and get to the same place. You know, and that's, and that's perfect because it, it has to do with neuroplasticity. Right. And that's the way that your brain kind of heals itself after damage, you know, after, after it sustains some type of injury, it rewires things so it can accomplish the same feats that it did before. Is that kind of like collateral circulation growing in CAD? Yes. <laughs> you know, that's a, that's a good analogy. Yeah. And, and really that's the miracle of treating opioid use disorders and treating addictions is the brain, unlike your heart and unlike your kidney, has this tremendous ability to heal itself, to make itself function again. And that's where we can treat these patients. You don't have to have a brain transplant to treat brain failure. So that's good news for anyone out there. But you do have to have good medications and good science to treat it. And what are those proven treatments? Medication-assisted treatment. How convenient. That's the topic of our next podcast. So why should UED providers care about this. Because no one sees these patients the way we do. No one sees the overdose, the shooter's abscesses, the patients coming to the ER and withdrawal. We really are better positioned than anyone in the house of medicine to make a difference. I'd say the other reason we should care is because these are emergencies. Patients with opioid use disorder are presenting to us with an emergency. And what do we pride ourselves in? Addressing life-threatening emergencies like this. We've ignored it for a long time. It's time we stop ignoring it. It's time we save lives. Thank you both. Uh, so gentlemen, my brain is full. Let's summarize. Uh, and I'll summarize with our five key takeaway points from today. Uh, first, addiction is misunderstood. It's a misunderstood disease. Undertaught in medical education and misunderstood by both medical providers and the public. Number two, babies can't be born addicted. The diagnosis of addiction in the DSM-5 is not just about tolerance and withdrawal, which babies can exhibit, but also about impaired control, social impairment, risky use, how opioid use impacts daily function. Third, addictions are deeply rooted in biology. Environment, including adverse childhood events, stress, psychological factors, age of exposure, it's a complicated mix of biology and environment. Fourth, addiction is a chronic, relapsing brain disease. It's the transition from controlled to impulsive and then compulsive drug intake. It's often described as a reward deficit disorder. We've just heard it described here as a brain failure. Finally, dopamine and different dopaminergic systems are severely affected by drug use, resulting in chronic changes and even death to parts of the brain. There are some who, like Dr. Stater, believe that brain failure is a more apt, less stigmatizing term than addiction. The most important takeaway here is that opioid addiction is a treatable disease. And we'll start to discuss how to treat that disease in our next episode on MAT. Thank you for listening to this first podcast in the Colorado Bridge series, MAT and the ED. Be sure to tune in for our next episode. Thank you for tuning in. You can find show notes, links to further information, and so much more at coloradomat.org. Please give us a visit.